This is Monster Theory Part 2.1. We're going to be covering the first four theses from the article, Monster Culture, Seven Theses, published in 1997 by Jeffrey Jerome Cohen. Number one, the monster's body is a cultural body. Each monster is an embodiment of the values, goals, fears, and anxieties of a particular culture. And monsters can always be viewed as a symbol or a key to understanding the culture that constructed them. So we're, again, we're talking metaphorically more so than literally. But if you were to imagine that a monster, say, for example, like Godzilla, who's pictured here, if Godzilla literally exists and you had its body, if you examined it the same way that, say, on CSI or something, they would perform an autopsy on a body to find out what had happened to it, to find out more about the identity if we didn't know about it, in a similar way, we can conduct an autopsy of a monster from the past to learn more about the culture that produced it. So here's a quote. The monstrous body is pure culture, a construct and a projection. The monster exists only to be read. The monstrum, from Latin, is etymologically that which reveals, that which warns. So we're coming back to what we were discussing earlier, that monstrum where monster even comes from, means that which reveals, that which warns. And again, coming back to Godzilla, one way in that Godzilla is a cultural body is by looking at the actual texture of his skin, of the skin on his body. So see how it almost looks like he was burnt or scarred? Sure, he looks like a lizard too, but a little bit worse than that. So that is supposed to be, um, to look like or to remind you of the keloid scarring that many Japanese people had on their own bodies that they suffered from um, if they were in Hiroshima or Nagasaki where the nuclear bombs were dropped. So the monster's body is a cultural body. Number two, the monster always escapes. Every scary movie has a sequel, right? If not more than one. So many monsters show up over and over in different historical contexts, in different cultural contexts, and in different clothing, literally and metaphorically. I've got some examples here of different versions of Dracula. So there are vampires across cultures, but even more specifically than that, ever since um, the book Dracula was published in 1897, we've seen different versions of it in film uh, in TV, different things like that. So what we're going to be watching soon is a, a German silent film called Nosferatu. That was published in 1922. That's when that film came out. And that's in the wake of World War I. So there's some unique features or characteristics of this version of Dracula because of the cultural and the historical context. Now, this really creepy dude down here. This is Dracula in a 1992 version of Bram Stoker's Dracula, directed by Francis Coppola. And that has different things based on what was going on in history and in, in, in the world, especially in, in the United States at that time. Now, an important note. While vampire-type monsters may be found in different cultures and times, this type of generalizing analysis is not very useful. By that, I mean to say that when we research a certain monster, we yield the most truth. Um, we, we yield the most truth and understanding, so to speak, when we focus on one particular rendering of a particular monster from a particular time and place. Yes, you can find things that are similar because... People are afraid of things sucking their blood across cultures and times, but if it gets really interesting when we focus on one. All right, next. The monster is a harbinger of ca category crisis. Monsters refuse easy categorization. That is part of what makes them dangerous because people like to put names and they like to separate things that are different. 
into categories. And the grammar is kind of funky there. Monsters are monstrous because they resist classification and integration. They don't fit in, right? Um, you might feel like you want to fit in. We all have that feeling. Then we might also have that fear that we just don't fit in and that people can see something different about us and we just want to blend. Well, monsters don't blend. They, by definition, don't fit in, and that's what makes them scary uh, because we see something and we don't know how to put it in a certain box um, and also because it scares us because – because it hits something deep inside of us that we're scared of ourselves, of not fitting in. Cohen calls them a form suspended between forms. Uh, and he also says that a monster is that which questions binary thinking and introduces a crisis. By binary thinking, binary refers to two, right? That's a That prefix um, denotes two things. So binary thinking is when you say yes or no, good or bad right or wrong. And so the way monsters are where they're part one thing and part another, right? They have an eyes from one animal and feet from another, and they're kind of like a person, all this, something in between, it makes us crazy because our brains want to categorize stuff. And it introduces a sort of a thinking crisis. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to make it go away because it's many different things all rolled into one. I'm going to illustrate that in a minute because this is a little bit complicated, a little bit complex. So you can see this uh, GIF, this GIF here, ridiculous. That's the spell that you use in the in one of the Harry Potter films and books to um, to tame a special kind of monster called a boggart. So I'll show you a clip in just a moment. to the guess as to what is inside. That's a bogart, that is. Very good, Mr. Tom. Now, can anybody tell me what a bogart looks like? No one knows. When she gets here. Bogarts are shapeshifters. They take the shape of whatever a particular person fears the most. That's what makes them so... So terrifying, yes, yes, yes. Luckily, a very simple charm exists to repel a bogart. Let's practice it now. Uh, without wands, please. After me. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Very good. A little louder. Very clear. Listen. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. This class is ridiculous. Very good. Well, so much for the easy part. You see, the incantation alone is not enough. What really finishes a boggart is laughter. You need to force it to assume a shape you find truly amusing. Let me explain. Uh, Devil, will you join me, please? Come on, don't be shy. Come on. Come on. Hello? Never. What frightens you most of all? Professor Snape. Sorry? Professor Snape. Professor Snape. <laughs> frightens all. And I believe you live with your grandmother. Yes, but I don't want that boggart to turn into her either. <laughs> no. It won't. I want you to picture her clothes, only her clothes, very clearly in your mind. She carries a red handbag. You don't need to hear. As long as you see it, we'll see it. Now, when I open that wardrobe, here's what I want you to do. Excuse me. Can you do that? Yes. One at the ready. One, two, three. <laughs> Think, never think. Ridiculous! <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, Neville, wonderful, incredible. Okay, to the back, Neville. Everyone form a line. <laughs> Form a line. I want everyone to picture the thing they fear the very most and turn it into something funny. 
Next. Rock. Concentrate. Hey, Sophie. Be brave. <laughs> That's the end of the lesson. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, darling. You can have too much of a good thing. All right. So that is an example of a monster that's really quite literally a harbinger of category crisis that changes versus uh, based on what your fear is. Let's see. Now, last one. The monster dwells at the gates of difference. You can see there's a little asterisk here, and it says um, this thesis. Let's see, once my little thing on the bottom there goes away. This is, okay, this is, oh, oh it's not going to show us. Oh, anyway, it says down there that this is, this thesis is key to our studies this unit. There we go. Across history, people take the differences they see in other groups and exaggerate them to the point of making them monsters. I kind of just put groups in brackets because it could it could be culture, it could be an in-group, out-group, it could be a religious group, whatever. Also, those differences between groups weren't so clearly defined um, until kind of modern history. So people take differences and exaggerate them, make other people monsters. So... This is a quote um, from the Cohen text. It's pretty dense, but I think it's important to get it in this original language. The monster embodies difference. It is an embodiment of the outside, the beyond. Any kind of alterity, difference, can be inscribed across, constructed through the monstrous body. But for the most part, monstrous difference tends to be cultural, political, racial, economic, sexual. Um, and by that, that can mean a lot of different things in terms of uh, gender identity, um, or also a lot of monsters back many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, or thousands of years ago, maybe were females, because a lot of the people who uh, were in power were males. And so whatever category of difference it is, people over time have turned others into monsters. I've got some examples here, but let me start with this. Representing an interior culture as monstrous justifies its displacement or extermination by rendering the act heroic. All right, those are a lot of big words, but it's a very important concept. Representing an interior culture, meaning, uh, so what this is referring to, I'll kind of give the examples and then I'll circle back to this. For example, in the book of Numbers, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, um, when the people came into the, the promised land, they referred to menacing giants. Whatever people, whatever ethnic group had been living in the land that they felt called by God to conquer and move into, they called them giants. Were they really, literally, actually, like monster giants? We can't really know. Um, 
but that would be an example of calling someone monsters. During the Crusades, so we're looking at uh, Middle Ages, around 10th, 11th century, somewhere around there, the French wrote epic poetry that portrayed Muslims as monsters. And we'll be coming back to this uh, in a few weeks. Jews were accused of making their Passover matzah, a bread that they um, that Jewish people would eat in observance of Passover, out of the blood of Christian children. And many hate crimes against Jews were committed um, because people claim that they were defending themselves and defending their children against monstrous Jews who did these things. Trouble was that they made up those things about them. Um, and from our own history, from American history, Americans called Native American savages um, and took their land. So these are examples, and maybe this quote will make more sense now, representing a culture that maybe was in a land or in, in power before, the dominant culture, when you represent them as monstrous, when you represent them as monsters, as less than human, it justifies displacing and or exterminating those people. Because we all know, most people agree that killing other people is wrong. But if you're not killing a person, if you're killing a monster, then you can kind of say that it's not even just, it's it's not even not wrong to do, but it makes you a hero to kill a monster. And then here's the example. The Chanson des Gestes celebrated the Crusades by transforming Muslims into demonic caricatures whose menacing, right, threatening lack of humanity was readable from their bestial attributes. So the character descriptions of Muslims in these uh, Chanson des Gestes uh, means basically epic, it's like epic poetry, hero stories. It, it gave character descriptions of Muslims that made them look and act like monsters. And because of that, people would then, you know, imply that they weren't humans, that they were monsters, that they were less than human. And if they were less than human, then it's not just okay to kill them, but it makes you a hero to kill them. All right, so here's a recap of theses one through four. One, the monster's body is a cultural body. Two, the monster always escapes. Three, the monster is a harbinger of category crisis. And four, the monster dwells at the gates of difference. So that's all for now. In the next video, Monster Theory Part 2.2, we'll cover the last of those theses.